Um, now we're going to bring up our student panelists. So we're going to have Liam from 2013. Come on up. Join us over there. Liam. We're going to have Reshmika. Come on up. Have a seat next to him. Shelby. Come on up. And Katie. There you are. So these, uh, these brave students have decided to get in front of you guys today and um, tell you about their action plan, their pro uh, the process, the journey that they went through, um, how they ultimately saw success. Um, some of them are still ongoing, some of them have wrapped up. And uh, we know today from speaking with you guys that uh, there are so many more stories out there and we're excited to, to um, as the day goes on, to get to know more of those success stories. Um, so why don't we start with 2013 and with Liam right over here. So please give him a hand. Why why don't you tell us um, what school you're from, uh, what session you did, and then you can go into your action plan. Okay, so um, I'm currently attending Newberry Park High School, um, which is in Newberry Park. And so when I went, I went in the 2013 uh, uh, leadership uh, camp, and that was my eighth grade, ninth grade summer. So that was before I'd even been to high school, and like before that I'd never been in like ASG or like any kind of like leadership class. So before that I kind of never really did leadership stuff, but I knew like sort of that I thought I'd be interested in it. So when I uh, got the opportunity, I got the letter of recommendation and then I um, attended a camp. And basically just, it was just a great experience. Like I just realized like how much that I can affect the community. And then from there, I decided that I wanted to help out by um, starting a peer tutoring program at the Boys and Girls Club at my middle school, uh, Bo uh, Sequoia Middle School. And then from there, I realized like I needed to get like a place. So they graciously, um, or like, um, excuse me, they really um, were like um, excited to have a program like this there. So they um, were awesome in helping me find like a spot and like a time for them to, for me to start the program. Then from there I went and got uh, volunteers. And then after that I started advertising. Uh, so at the so at Sequoia Middle School I went and um, got them to like announce it like in the morning that after school we'd be having this free program at the Boys and Girls Club if they wanted to help. Because I really wanted it to be more about like the students versus like being forced to do like a peer tutoring program because a lot of kids like at lunch there was this forced thing that you had to do if like you weren't doing very well in your classes and I wanted it to be for like the kids who just know that they need a little bit of help but that like um, and for them to like reach out for it so we advertised it at school and then we advertised it at the club and then other than that we um, just were just spreading the word kind of like by word of mouth and um, from there we got 10 to 15 kids every week that would always show up and I had about 10 volunteers total. We'd have like about like six or seven each week, I think, that would show up. And so from there, we ran it from November to March. So about like five months that we ran the program. And so that was like a trimester at the um, at Sequoia Middle School. So from there, we could like track the progress and see how they were doing from the trimester before. And so from there, we were able to see that just, just by having just even a little bit of help, even those that just wanted like a quiet place to work, because we had we ranged from like kids who just wanted a spot to work to like kids who we just stayed with the whole time and helped them. You could just see just how much more they were like engaged in like learning the material and a lot of them um, brought their grades up like substantially from like B's to like uh, B's and A's and stuff. So that was pretty successful. And we ended it in March just because of time basically. That was probably the biggest obstacle I would say. Time because um, just finding people the right time because while volunteering is awesome for everyone to do, like there's always other stuff going on and it's not like a job where you like have to be there kind of thing. So that was probably the toughest part with getting enough people to like be there and to support us. So right now I've completed the program. I've like, considered it's completed, but I'm always open to like um, helping others that would like that are interested in the program. I know um, the director at the club has asked me like if um, someone comes in and they want to help peer tutor that I would let them like I can help them and mentor them to like um, do the same kind of thing that I did there. And so yeah, basically just it was a really rewarding experience and from this program, I've now joined ASG at our school with Katie over here, and um, we just, I just have a blast doing leadership stuff, and it's just, I realized that, like, it's basically, I guess I would say my calling to do, to lead people and stuff, and I realized that it's not just something that you want to, um, it's not just, like, something that you just do because you think it's, like, the right thing to do, it's something that you, like, are passionate about also. And after you did the uh, your peer tutoring program, you applied for a certain award. Can you? Yeah. Uh, after the peer tutoring program, I applied for the Boys and Girls Club uh, Youth of the Year in the 14 and up category. Basically, there's like a in our area, it's like the Conejo Valley uh, District for Boys and Girls Club. So I applied for that and interviewed for that so that I could represent them and basically as well as any other organization that I've been involved with. So uh, representing the library as well. And so I actually won that award. Um, so I'm currently Youth of the Year 2013-2014. Uh, 
And so um, basically applied for that, and now I've just been representing the club and then trying to help my club out as much as I can, as well as representing the Reagan Library. And what uh, grade are you currently in, Liam? I'm currently a sophomore. I have a feeling uh, when you start the college application process, <laughs> you'll have some pretty good stuff to put on that application. Yeah, I hope so. Congratulations, Liam. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to hear from Rashmika now. And Rashmika, what session were you in? Um, I was in session five. This that's past summer. Yeah, that's the best session. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put the mic a little closer? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I'm from Moore Park High School. I'm currently a sophomore, and I attended the program my freshman summer. Um, my project is called Friends for Patients, and I basically came up with the idea for the project when I visited the hospital and I saw like how terrifying it is really to be like for like these kids who are just sitting there practically the whole day and sometimes their parents aren't able to be there with them because they have to go to work too. So I just wanted to make it a better experience for them and that's when I started my project and my project is to give the kids at the hospital something to do the whole day, um, maybe something to give them a little bit of hope and optimism. So. I got them um, coloring books because I found out that a lot of them can't really do much um, laying in a hospital bed, but coloring books seem to be enjoyable. And then I also am going to make them pillows with um, kind of optimistic quotes, which is an idea that I got from this program. I'm sure you guys all remember when we did a lot of uh, quote activities and um, searching for things, searching for quotes that inspired us. So I feel like if the kids woke up every morning to have something inspirational and motivational, they just have a better day and experience overall. Um, I started my project out by looking for, I need a lot of money, first of all, to complete the project. So I had to, I went out to adults in my community and I got turned down seven times actually <laughs> before I found the one person to say yes. And um, she actually owned a local haircut shop and she was willing to do a name your own haircut price day where people could come in and pay whatever they want for a haircut. And usually when I explain to them my cause and my project, they have paid more than what the haircut was actually like worth. And that's how I raised around um, $700 towards my project. And then after that, with that money, I had um, funding to show that I could apply for a grant because to apply for grants, I just learned this, but you need to show them that you've put the effort in to raise your own money. And with that, I applied for the Youth Opportunities Fund grant. And I received a grant for $300 this year. And then they've also agreed to keep funding me the grant the rest of my high school year. So I hope to continue doing this project as long as this goes. And right now, I'm currently in the final phase of my project. I'll be completing the pillows next week um, at the Chamber of Commerce, which I've also set up. And um, I'll just be donating them after that. So that's my plan. Thank you, Rashmi. Um, one thing I remember from an email that you sent, Rashmika, was that um, you've said your elevator pitch so many times that you could say it in your sleep, I believe is what you said. Yeah, I mean, the elevator pitch was something that like really helped me a lot. Because every time I reached an adult in the community, being able to give that pitch to them like, confidently is what got them to approve my project, and yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, now we'll hear from Katie. Katie. Okay, so I'm, my name's Katie Owens. I was in session two of this past summer. I'm a senior at Newbury Park High School. Uh, I wanna start off by saying, I think you guys are both sophomores, right? Yeah. So that's like kind of intimidating for older people um, <laughs> who are kind of like looking like, maybe there's no hope. Like, oh my gosh, I have to be a sophomore to do things. Um, you don't. So my plan was basically, let me start off with this. I work at the Alamo Bar and Grill in Newbury Park, and I work at the takeout counter, and I saw a lot of homeless people coming up to buy the dollar tacos and dollar burritos that we have with, you know, the change they get from donations and things. Um, and then I would go into the back of the kitchen and also see all this leftover buffet food being thrown into the trash just because we couldn't keep it, we can't really serve that food at the end of the night. Even though it's still good, it's just not something you serve to customers for however much we, they're, they're paying for it. Um, and it was, it was something I, I looked at and was kind of saddened by, but then I thought, wait, 
there's homeless people, there's this F extra food. They put two and two together and basically said, why don't we get this food to be able to be donated to the homeless somehow through some official means. Um, and so I started calling a bunch of local churches that I knew donated food to um, people in need. And a lot of them turned me down just because of sanitary reasons and food regulations. Um, I, I went into places and they would say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll tell this person about it. Um, and it, that person would get back to me in a couple weeks or even longer than that. And so I really had to kind of push my way through that um, and keep calling, keep revisiting. And I finally found one church that was very open to taking this extra food. And so now every Sunday, that's when we have buffets, um, they come at 3 o'clock, pick up that food, and donate it to, or they, they take it, packages it all up, and they give it that same night out to the people in need in the community. And it's just something that's been really cool to see and something that I hope to continue um, and I hope to really see all the way through for, for however long the business stays open. So there you go. Now we have Shelby. Hi. I'm Shelby Kaplan, and I was in session two this past summer. And my project, I had actually started in middle school when I was in seventh grade as a mitzvah project, which was kind of a required community service project before you have your bat mitzvah. And when I started it, it was on a very low scale, but now it's doing a lot better. So now I'm gonna explain what it is. <laughs> um, it's, I call it Heal the Heart with Art, and it's similar to hers, I'm sorry, I don't know. Fresh Mika. It, I collect arts and craft supplies and donate them to the local children's hospital. And the reason I started this was when I was in seventh grade, a friend of mine had dropped out of school and completely lost contact with us and none of us really knew why until he came back and he wore a hat every day and I later found out is he had leukemia and the hat was because he had lost his hair and so I knew I wanted to help I wanted to help people that had a similar problem but I didn't know how to go about doing that and I couldn't work directly with children because I was too young. So then a couple months later, I was in the hospital because a minor surgery went wrong. So I was hospitalized for about a week and I was bored and miserable and I'm a happy person. I smile all the time. So when your parents and friends who come to visit you are seeing you without that smile and just miserable and broken there's nothing they can really do and then an uncle of mine brought this little craft for me to do and I was 13 so you get a craft and you're like okay I'm not five anymore <laughs> but I was bored and I'd watched every TV show I possibly could so I started doing this craft and it's just fun and relaxing and I was actually smiling and the colors made the room seem brighter. So when I got out, I decided that's what I needed to do. I needed to collect arts and crafts and give them to children who are hospitalized like I was or for longer periods of time so that they can get that smile on their face because not only does it heal their heart, it heals their parents. So I reached out to someone at Children's Hospital and found out that they actually have an art center, kind of, but they're very lacking on donations and supplies. So I said, great, that's my job now. So I went to a, an arts and crafts convention with my grandfather and I would go to companies and just kind of pass out my letter. But 
it was weird because there was like a giant convention center and each company would have their little post set up. And I would just kind of walk up and try and find someone in charge and be like, hi, do you want to donate? And I felt really weird about it. And then I kept doing that, but people didn't always feel that inclined to donate because it's this little kid who could or could not be serious about it. And I wasn't really confident. And then I came to the program and that definitely boosted my confidence from the elevator speech thing. And so I would go to companies and be like, hey, I finally know what I'm saying. <laughs> and not only was, did it help to get more donations, it helped to boost my confidence. And then this past year, I couldn't go to the convention because school and AP classes and I was in a play and I just had too much going on. So I took all of the emails and addresses that I had received from people mailing me donations and I sent out emails to every company that I possibly could. So on my Friday night where I finally get to relax at the end of the week, I was watching TV as well as having my computer on my lap to send emails. And so I was able to acquire pretty much just as many donations this year and I also started social media sites so that just not companies, normal people that go, hey, I have random markers sitting in my cabinet and my kids don't need this. I'm gonna donate it. And then they'd know where to do that. So it's going pretty well. We're gonna turn it over to you guys if you um, have some audience questions or comments that you wanna make. But before we do that, one thing that stood out um, that was sim similar in all of your stories was um, hearing rejection, hearing no at some point, and then continuing on to you ultimately were told yes. Um, can Liam or Reshmika, one of you speak a little bit more about that and, and just what that felt like to hear no and then to keep going and finally hear yes? Well, I was really lucky in uh, getting the first yes, basically the first time I asked uh, for the location just because I knew the Boys and Girls Club and I knew like I'd been an involved member there. So I knew that like um, when I went to ask, they already knew that they wanted to have me there and I was really excited by that. But probably like you said, like there's always rejection and everywhere that you're gonna be doing projects and that would probably be with the volunteers. And just when you like put up flyers and when you like put in a lot of effort, it just like can be kind of frustrating sometimes when like there's like only a very small percentage that says like actually yes versus like, oh no, I can't do this, I'm sorry, I'm too busy, I wish I could help, but I can't kind of thing. And so that was probably the most frustrating thing, but the way you get past that, you just keep going, you just keep trying, you just have to stay determ determined, you have to be like passionate about what you're doing, otherwise it's just not gonna like, just it's not just gonna fall into place, you just have to keep going, keep pushing past it. Um, and then once you do, it's just a really rewarding experience. My story was like a little different. Um, I had seven rejections actually. And I kept thinking like, oh, why am I getting rejected? Um, maybe this project just isn't gonna work out. Maybe no one's interested in funding me. Um, there was a point where I just wanted to give up, but my parents like encouraged me to push through it and they said someone's gonna say yes eventually. And I just kept going and I finally found someone. So, I mean, rejection is something that happens to everyone, but if it happens, all you need is that one person to say yes. So you just have to keep trying. And specifically, Katie, you were told um, not just no for no other reason, not having enough hours in the day or not being able to, to give funds. Yours was more related to food policies and regulations. How, how, how did you think that you could ultimately get past that? Well, it was kind of, um, the, I think the quote is to try the same thing and expect different results is the definition of insanity. Um, and so it was something where if, if I think, I think if I had been rejected more, I would have really read up on food policy, but I got the yes soon enough that thankfully I didn't. Um, but going to those churches, I would really have to use my elevator pitch. Um, and then when they would say no, kind of keep trying and say, okay, so I know 
Maybe you're thinking like, this is the only way to donate food. Are you sure there's no other way that you could help me? Is there something we could set up? Is there a way we could go around this and kind of um, not, ex not accepting no, but in the politest way possible, I think, um, kind of getting them to delve into what they can maybe do for you and like see how you guys can work around it together. Um, Cause the food that, the, not the food, the church that ended up taking donations has a program where the food from the restaurant wouldn't be accepted because of food regulations. But then they also have a program that doesn't necessarily have to adhere to that cause it's not associated with, um, what is it? The food bank. Um, so it, there was a way around it and it was kind of opening them up to that possibility and like making them realize that there was also another way to do it and that kind of being that kind of per people person and like, hey, work with me on this. Let's, let's get through it together because this is a really good cause. And a lot of times that's what I think you'll find. You'll find people who want to help but maybe um, don't necessarily know the right way, but they have the tools and so it's you reaching out to them and making like figuring out a way together to move around that obstacle. And uh, in the activities later today, before you guys leave, we are going to be giving you brand new resources um, for getting the word out, for getting volunteers, for getting funding. So I hope that the uh, questions and the advice and suggestions that they've given, that you guys will take to heart in, no matter where you're at, and even our panelists up here are still on their own journey of how they're going to continue to grow it or transfer their skills to, to possibly another project. Um, but now I want to hear from you guys. So who has any questions or comments um, to the panel or even about your own uh, success stories that you guys have had? You want to go over Shelby's option? Oh, I'm sorry. Your <laughs> obstacles, Shelby. Okay. Um, so when I went to the companies for the first time at this convention, I went to one company and the guy looked at me and there's an older man and he said, well, how do I know that you're not doing this just to keep the supplies to yourself? I'm a little girl. I'm not tall. I'm 13 and I'm just like, why would I do that? <laughs> like, what are you, what do you mean? And he's like, well, how do I know I'm not going to give you crafts and you're just going to use them with your friends? And I'm like, because I wouldn't have a letter and be asking you if I was just going to do that. I would just go to the store. And he was just very rude. And so I kind of felt struck down, like people don't even believe me. So how are they going to see the worth in what I'm doing? So the following year, I got a letter from Children's Hospital just saying kind of what I was doing and how great it was to go along with the letter asking people to donate. So I had my proof. And luckily, I didn't see that same guy again. But had I seen him, and if he sees how well it's going now, then um, he knows he's the one missing out. He's the one who didn't donate because he was too stubborn in thinking that a little kid could n never do anything to change the world. And so many people have that mentality, and it's so wrong. And all of us sitting here who care enough to go to a leadership program, we're going to change the world, and we're going to prove all of those people wrong because we're starting now. All right, don't make me call on you. I know your stories. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Skylar does. Oh, Skylar has a question. We'll let Skylar talk. I, I do. And uh, if you guys were in session oh, no, one or two, um, you had the pleasure of working with Skylar, one of our educators who left shortly after. So he's here on his own time today. He's not an educator anymore. We miss him. But give him a hand for coming today and supporting you guys. Okay, go ahead. I actually have a question. So um, one of the activities that we did during student leadership was case studies. And one of those case studies was about a young girl who um, developed a closet for 
girls who needed more self-confidence. Shelby, she recognized her donors by Facebook and that sort of thing. Do you do the same thing with your donors? Um, so every once in a while, I'll get an extremely generous donation. And I mean, no matter what the donation is, I'll write a letter of recommendation. And I mean, a thank you letter, what am I saying? <laughs> OK. And every once in a while, I'll like, say, hey, this is a great company on Facebook or whatever. Thank you so much for donating. But I mean, not many companies have joined the page on Facebook. So it's not that important to say, thank you. You'll never see this, but thank you. Um, but like the following year, if I go to the convention, I'll always say to them, thank you so much for donating last year, and I hope we can continue that relationship. And every once in a while, they'll request that I get like um, pictures of me bringing in the donations or of the kids using some of their prod product. And so obviously, I can't take them because I'm too young to be around the children, but this summer. Um, so they're the person who I partner with at Children's Hospital will take some pictures and send them to me so that I can send them to the company and they definitely appreciate that. Rashmika, I know that the haircut place in Moorpark was the place that allowed you to go there for the full day and um, solicit those donations. Um, I thought the time of year that you did that was really uh, smart on your part because it was just before school starts. So most people are getting their hair cut before school starts. Um, are you thinking of doing that again this summer? Do you, are you gonna promote for students to, to go and, and support that business the way they supported you? Yeah, actually, um, kind of building on that question, I uh, wrote a letter to my local Acorn um, newspaper, it's in Moore Park, and I actually wrote a letter thanking uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, the business owner, for um, all of her you know, generous donations and like allowing me to hold a fundraiser at her shop. And that really helped her a lot. She really appreciated it actually because it brought in some more business to her place and just recognized her as someone who's contribu contributing to our community. And um, I do plan on continuing with that project um, to partner with her again. And I kind of spread the word out last year by um, passing out flyers during, during school registration, which was like a week before school started. So I think that's how I got a lot of people to participate. So I hope to do that again. Katie, when you first uh, proposed your idea to the restaurant, the Alamo, how did they receive it? And did they consider it a liability to donate the food or what? Actually, it was, it was very interesting. I had taken kind of like a week to really finalize my elevator pitch because um, my leadership action plan from the program was actually to build a field in the Caneo Valley. So very different. Um, once I realized kind of the impracticality of that, I moved on to this. And so I, I spent a while kind of formulating that pitch. And once I pitched it to the owner, he was like, that sounds like a great idea. You know, we've tried to do that before, but the Catholic Church won't take it because there's a church right next to the restaurant. And, you know, I just don't really have the time to kind of organize that. But if you want to take it on, that's, that's totally fine. And so it was, it was a really cool encouragement and support. Um, and I, I totally had all these, like, reasons why and, like, I can do this. Like, don't worry, I'll, I'll take on this, I'll take this responsibility, which I ended up taking anyway because he didn't have the time as a restaurant owner trying to manage employees and food and all that good stuff. Um, but he was totally open to the idea and very welcoming. So, no, I didn't necessarily have an obstacle in that way. Daniel? Do I, do I stand up? Oh, is that what I sound like? Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, what do you think is, is your most valuable skill or talent, and how did it help you in your action plan? That's to all of you, just. I'll 
I'll just start. Um, for me, I knew that like uh, with my plan in peer tutoring, I knew that I was really like strong. Like academics is always something that I've been fortunate enough to be really strong in. So I knew that I wanted to try to help other people with my personal talent in academics. By uh, so I came up with my plan to tutor, and so just basically, just when you think about like oh like what can I do? What am I? What do I know I'm good at? Kind of thing. That's really helpful. Just to, like think about and then you can realize from there like how you can take your step and like take steps to like bring that to the community and bring that to others to help um, share your gift basically. As, I'm gonna interrupt just really quick. As uh, somebody who I used to run a tutoring center and if I have a pool of resumes in front of me, job applicants, somebody who was peer tutoring at such a young age that he was would absolutely stand out. Um, amongst the rest, so just putting that out there for, I don't know if you want to be a teacher, Liam, but I know that, you know, whatever you guys do, whatever your action plan is, and it, that is your work experience, that's your job experience. It doesn't matter whether it was paid or it was not paid, and if anything, it, it's really going to show that your, your determination um, when you go out there into the field when it's time to get a job, so. Sorry, I just wanted to add to that. That's just a really important point because, um, like I said earlier, just this program has like opened so many doors for me and just basically, like you said, it's my, been my work experience from the, from the program and from running peer tutoring, I was able to go and be, uh, to get nominated for Youth of the Year and then actually win the award and I got second place, like Coastal, which is like just like a bigger area out of people. And then just from there, I was able to apply and get into ASG at our school. And just it just keeps building on different things in your career. And it just is so helpful just to have like a starting point like this. Just is like so fortunate just to be such like already having like a pedestal above kind of thing. OK. Um, I think my most valuable skill is being able to communicate with people around me. I think if I wasn't able to give my elevator speech to the business owners in my community, then there was no way I would have actually gone on with my project. And I think that it's really like important that we build like communication skills. I, I found like through this program actually that like I like to um, do public speaking things and I compete in public speaking and I have a lot of fun with that. So it's also my skill but my hobby at the same time. So um, I'm definitely a people person as well and I would say one of the things that helped me complete my leadership action plan was not accepting no, but also, and kind of like having that optimism to push through, um, but also being able to follow through on my part and realize where my weaknesses were. Um, I was thinking while I was doing this, I'm kind of like a politician in the fact that I would promise lots of things and then not follow through on certain ones just because I would forget about them or, you know, Holidays came along, school, work, sports, everything. You, we all know we're all pretty busy people. And so it was kind of looking inward and saying, okay, so I just promised this. I just took on this responsibility. Now I need to follow through on that and doing whatever it took to follow through on it, whether it was like writing it on my hand every morning, having Siri remind me, or um, you know, having it right there like as I walked out of my door going to school. So those kinds of things, like being introspective and looking at my weaknesses, I think was a skill that definitely helped me go through the plan. For me, it was definitely communication and optimism. So even when that guy shot me down, I continued to go to companies even if they might shut me down too. And it definitely took the optimism there. And I love public speaking. It's always been a passion of mine. And being on stage, performing, all of that. So when I get on stage to do something, whether it's giving a speech or it's just talking one-on-one -on -one with someone to convince them to donate it's I just kind of convince myself it's the same thing because in life if you want to get where you need to be sometimes you need to do some acting in order for people to see eye to eye with you in order for people to feel your passion and 
So I definitely have taken my public speaking to other places. Um, currently, I am in a student speech contest. So I'm headed to the third level uh, in two weeks. So that's exciting. And I just use it all around. I'm in youth and government um, through the YMCA. And I run for positions whenever I can, whether I get them or not. This year I ran for about five positions I think I interviewed for, and I didn't get any of them. But I remained optimistic that I'm going to go for some of the same ones next year because it's fun and it's an experience. And just looking at myself and seeing how much my interview changed from my first interview to get a position to my second one where I was so much more confident and comfortable with my answers. I uh, have a question about your parents. Would you say that they were helpful, that they were not involved, or that they were too pushy? Uh, with my parents, they were definitely supportive, but I wouldn't say like they were involved at all because they just knew that it was like it was my action plan. It was what I was passionate about, and they knew that they were just gonna let me go with it and just see like how well I could do. I guess so. It wasn't they weren't they weren't pushy, but they were definitely supportive. And but at the same time, they just let me work it out. And then like if I had, like an issue like with trying to get volunteers, they would just say like, oh well, that kind of happens in the workplace as well. You just need to make sure you like keep, stay positive and keep pushing and be determined, kind of thing. So I guess just, they, they were helpful definitely, I would say, but they also like kept their space and made it so that it was my project and that I was able to like succeed on my own kind of thing. Yeah, I also agree. Um, my parents, they didn't push me in any way. They were completely supportive with my project. They would give me advice, like whenever I wouldn't get volunteers, whenever I wanted to just give up, they'd tell me to keep on going, which I think is like, why I'm he here where I am today. And also, I mean, they help me drive to places, like get to where I need to go for everything. And um, I think they're definitely helpful. Yeah, my parents were supportive, but not involved. Just like, good job, <laughs> keep it up, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my parents were they weren't all that involved. Like every once in a while, my dad would plan a day with my connection at Children's Hospital for us to drive down there at donate and donate because obviously I can't drive. And even if I could, I don't really want to drive all the way to LA with traffic and all of that. So just making that happen, but they were just there if I needed them. And they were always supportive and saying like we're proud of you and stuff but I think my biggest drive was um, my brother actually we're three years apart he's three years older than me and he's like we have a really good relationship we're best friends and he always was kind of the golden child in my mind because he's straight-a student and now he goes to an Ivy League. So um, I always kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps, but I think realizing that I can do similar stuff, but I don't have to be him. I can still, like he didn't do youth and government. He didn't do programs like this. He didn't do public speaking. So realizing that I can still get straight A's, but I can be me and do my stuff kind of drove me to go I can do this project, whether someone else did it or not. I can do it. I'm me. I have the power. Liam, how did the Reagan Foundation help you or support you on your uh, after you left here? Well, definitely with the application process for the Boys and Girls Club, that was extremely helpful. I know um, a lot of the um, mentors and teachers from that time helped like give me letters of recommendation that you did and that was very helpful and just explained to them like how I was involved here and stuff but also we had a day towards the end of the tutoring where um, you guys came in and you brought uh, pizza and you did this whole like little thing where we just like we celebrated like both the volunteers for being there and for the students for their high achievements and like improving their grades and stuff so uh, you guys were with us the whole way every time like every other weekend I think at 
like at the very least, I would email you saying, hey, how's, uh, it's going pretty well for us. Um, and I know you guys would check in every once in a while too and just say, hey, how's it going? We want to know like, has anything changed? Did you guys improve on this? Or like, are you working on this? Like what's new kind of thing? So uh, the foundation's always been there pretty much with my plan in both my future endeavors. Just a hint, hint for anyone else. Um, that is looking for our support, and I'm actually going to call someone out now because she's one of the most recent uh, uh, success stories, and we're going to be doing the same thing. So, will you stand up and tell us what the uh, tell them a little bit about what we'll be doing? Pr uh, I believe in April. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, hi, Kayla Stafford. Oh, is it working? Oh, okay. Um, uh, I when I came here, my plan was. Uh, uh, prepared this for adulthood because I felt like high schools were really lacking in like classes for financial planning like I had a lot of friends who were going off to college and they were freaking out because they're like I don't know how to play pay for college tuition I don't know any of this stuff and I was like yeah we really don't like learn that like we learn polynomial functions we learn like this stuff and it's just like when am I going to use this so I went to my school and I was like can we somehow like get a class to like financial planning, and they said, well, we can't get a class, but you could put together a seminar. So it took a really long time. So finally I went, like, it, to get it approved, to get counselors to support, to get teachers to support it, but, like, eventually I went to Wells Fargo, got some representatives, like, on my side, and they agreed to do presentations, and we put together a whole PowerPoint, and... Um, right now, yeah, we picked a date, and so we should be doing the seminar for over 200 students. Uh, they're all seniors for political science, economics classes, and it's basically about budgeting, debit cards, credit cards, and yeah, budgeting for college. And so, yeah. <laughs> over 200 students, that's a lot of pizza. But we'll do the same thing for you guys if you need the support. Here's Evan. Hello. Oh. Uh, I have a question uh, for seniors, because since we're going away, uh, it's kind of challenging to get people that have like the same kind of view viewpoint that you do. So ha what would be like some tips on like how do we get more people to take our place when we leave? Yeah, what grade a, are you in, Katie? I'm a senior, <laughs> so I won't be working at the place I work for very much longer, I mean, probably this summer. Um, I think that comes down to communication. I think, and also um, transferring that optimism and that drive and that passion to people who can take it on. Um, and I think that that is a part of communication, communicating your ideas so that they too understand the importance of it and, and really making, developing them as leaders. I think whether or not it was um, direct, we kind of learned that in the program. I mean, we have all of these educators around us who are also developing their leadership skills, but they're cultivating us as leaders as well. And so we can kind of take hints and tips from them on how to make other people passionate about our project as well. And I think that's when you kind of have to communicate that idea and then go, hands off, this is all you. I've communicated all I know to the best of my ability and I have complete trust and faith that you will carry this through and maybe even make it better. Um, but the, the foundation is communication, I think. I remembered what I was going to say. Um, anyway, <clears throat> yes. I think also having, just to answer your question, sir, um, also trusting others to take over as well makes a difference in, in, in itself. Um, but you guys have kind of already spoken to this, but um, I'm actually the uh, advisor for the, for the uh, philanthropy club at my school. And um, one thing I've noticed uh, is this semester, uh, it's a lot more difficult to get the manpower to do our projects uh, because everyone's getting really busy now. Um, APs, are, uh, tests are coming up. Uh, it seems like everything is culminating right now, but um, I'm just wondering because I know you, you're all very, very ambitious, and I guess anyone can really answer this, but um, how do you find the balance, I guess, to, to get the job done yet 
maintain your sanity at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to speak on this. So, I'm a really busy person. I have Hebrew school once a week, and I TA at my temple every weekend. I do youth and government every Wednesday night, which includes going away on three different trips, which I have to miss school for, which means catching up on the work when I come back. Um, I do aerial acrobatics. I'm doing my project. I do the plays at school, and um, for me, last semester was busier because I was in the play at my school and I had a lead, so every day after school we had rehearsal until about six or seven at night. So getting home and still being willing to do my homework and do my AP work was definitely a struggle because you're exhausted and you just want to go to bed and <laughs> then your teachers come back with well why didn't you do your work and you just want to cry um but i think finding that one free day to just do a little bit of work finding that weekend where you don't have a ton of homework and you can just sit down, watch TV, and have your computer so you can shoot some emails to people that can help you with your project. Or just if you're somewhere and you run into someone who you think could help, just being ready to say, hey, I'm here, you're here, let's talk. I finally have a little bit of time. So just use utilizing every minute you have is how you're going to get where you want to go. <laughs> yeah, oh, I was going to answer that also. Uh, for me, I would say that's also like, it's just the little things that you really have to pay attention to. And I know I keep going back to this about being passionate, but like running a program, any kind of program that you have, running some sort of project does take time and effort. And you really do have to be determined with that because as we all said, we're really busy. We all have classes. We all have extracurricular activities. And then this is something else to add on to it. But just those little things, like I would say maybe for one of the like little things, just sending like te five texts to people saying, hey, can you volunteer next week? Or hey, can you volunteer on Friday? That would probably be those little things, just communicating with people, just getting people organized, just those little like things here and there just to make sure that like your program is set up and just to make sure that like, you know, you, you're not doing it all on your own. You're not being stressed out that day that you can just uh, help as much as you can, just like be there for your program is probably like the best thing, those little small things. Um, this question's for Liam. Uh, so at the Youth Summit, my group, we wanted to open up a teen center at the Parks and Rec so teens could just like come in and hang out and you know, there could be volunteer opportunities and job opportunities there. And you mentioned you uh, kind of use the Boys and Girls Center. How did you um, like maintain the facility? Did you have to pay any kind of rent or how did you kind of like negotiate uh, that? With the Boys and Girls Club, I went there for three years when I was in middle school, so it was already like my second home to me, basically, and I knew the directors and uh, mem members, directors, and everyone that worked there really well. So when I went and approached them about this, as a nonprofit organization, they're really excited to offer another opportunity at their club. So um, it was uh, available to the members, and for uh, non-members, there was like a small fee, and I worked with her. I think I got it down to like 10 bucks if you wanted to do like a non-member. We didn't have any non-members sign up when we did it, but we did have enough like um, actual like members of the club ready that we were uh, confident in like having a class every week or every other week. And so basically, uh, we just, when we talked to her, we just like laid out our plan, kind of like the elevator pitch, and just kind of said basically, here's what we want to do. Would you be willing to do this? And like, would we need to provide anything? And basically, all th we were fortunate enough for them to just say, provide the tutors, provide like your advertising, um, like because we like printed out flyers and handed them out and stuff. So provide that, and then we'll give you the room to use during for like the first hour or whatever, um, and however long you need. And we just basically went from there. So we were very fortunate in that. And so basically, I would just say try to reach out like to other people that you know and other like clubs that you know, see who knows who kind of thing, and then just go along with. Um, basically like where you think your best option would be and just try to go um, see who's willing to help, especially nonprofits are really helpful. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, for me, it's easy to advertise my project to like adults just because they'll listen. But it's, I play football and basketball for my high school. And so there's some times where I'm sitting there and I'm like, hmm, how am I gonna make 200 teenage boys interested in doing this and helping out? 
because they don't care about much else. So do you have any tips on like how you can advertise what you do at your school or you know, how it got successful spread around your school? Could you elaborate on your project just a little bit? Like, what are you trying to motivate them? Shoot, to do? okay. Um, I started something that I actually had going on before I came here, but uh, called Operation Kids Care. Um, I started it because I had a friend when I was a little kid who he served in the military. He was a, in the Special Forces in the Navy, but he, did, he developed PTSD. And uh, it's a serious problem going on nowadays. One, in f every, one in, out of every five veterans have PTSD, and 20% of all suicides are veterans with PTSD. And uh, my, my friend, who is pretty much my big brother, came home, and he actually committed suicide. And so I was sitting there. I was like, I can do something to help because I don't want anyone. It's not fair. And so I started to raise money and awareness for PTSD to prove that you know this is a real thing and this is, there is actually help out there. And I live in such a I'm blessed to live in such a pro military community where you know we have streets lined with all the names of people in the community who serve. And of course, me, who's wanting to serve as well. It's just something I was very passionate about. But um, that's my project, pretty much. And your question is kind of like, how do you convey that passion to other people? Yeah. Um, I would say, like, just listening to your story was very moving. Um, if you can find a group of a small, it can be a small group of five to 10 people, maybe, that's just as passionate as you are, that group can turn into a larger and larger group. And I think, I think it's contagious in some regard. So it, it starts with you telling, giving your pitch, telling people why this is such a big, why this is such a good cause, um, getting them on the same page as you, and then taking that and expanding it. And um, people don't like necessarily to be told what to do. They like to see what to do, I think, in a lot of regards. Um, it's something I've noticed just like running a club where you kind of want to get people like hyped to be at the club like Yeah, we're not sitting out in the hot sun. We're not in the classroom. There's pizza. This is awesome, right? But sometimes if you don't have Other people who are excited about that if it's just you then obviously it's very hard to get everyone else excited about it so it's it was up to me to kind of build that leadership team that of those charismatic outgoing people people um, and getting them on the same page as you so that you guys can all spread that same passion I think yeah uh, I'm gonna add to, to Nick's and to Katie's right now um, if you've uh, have, have any of the students here ever attended the Medal of Honor event that we've had here at the library okay oh nice some of you um, I would I would suggest um, even seeing if you want to get a school administrator or teacher to bring a class here. Um, we, we sponsor bus scholarships. We have 600, 800 students that um, come to these events. And so to hear it from the panel, we've got our speakers of students here, but they're sitting in the same seats as these amazing heroes that Alan talked about heroes. These, these Medal of Honor recipients are more than deserving of all of the recognition. And so um, possibly, you know, having them be a little bit more aware. Um, they may not know anybody who is a veteran. They may not know anybody who, who has suffered from PTSD. But to come and expose um, a group of students from your school to even hearing the stories of what they went through um, in war, it, that could be very moving in itself. And like she said, as knowing your story as well, your connection to that. So um, just a recommendation. All right. I was also just going to say something I've done. Just to, I've tried to make it interesting to kids my age. Like I've tried my hardest. I've contacted as many people. I had a long conversation with a man named, you may recognize it, Marcus Luttrell. He was, if you don't know who that is, that's the lone survivor. He was the actual survivor of the Navy SEAL. I had a long conversation. I have his phone number. I talk to him regularly about my future and then also my, what I'm doing. Um, I've had conversations with m multiple Navy SEALs. Uh, the wife of Chris Kyle, I've talked to him before, her before. Um, Gary Sinise runs his own foundation. And uh, I'm just like, 
when you make these connections, it's hard for me to also to figure out what to do with them. Because, okay, I know Gary Sinise, cool. I know Mark Slatrell. Now, how can they, how can I convince them to help me? Because they are such powerful figures. If you know how to help with that as well, that would be great. Well, seeing that you have that connection, definitely utilizing it and asking them if they would be able to come to your school and possibly having a seminar like she is to educate people and have them hear other stories because if you have your story and all of their stories and you have like a panel like this where they can ask them questions like then they're truly in it and they can definitely find a passion for it. Sierra? Hi. Um, Okay, yeah, there's Katie, Katie, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely a time when, oh, when no one's, you know, getting excited about things with you. You know that you're, so, there's a point where you're kind of alone in it, but congratulations for, like, getting people together with that, and you too. Um, and also, like, I don't know, suicidal thoughts are such a common thing in our generation today, and um, I just kind of thought of an I could maybe like, I don't know. Um, my leadership project it doesn't have to do with that at all, but I'm kind of hoping to do something with that in the future. But um, yeah, if you guys know anybody who's like going through like anxiety or depression periods and stuff, it's a really common thing. And it, I don't know, if you have a friend like that, just remind them that they're not alone because it's a thing that where you just, you really feel alone in it. Um, but I just encourage you guys, if you know anyone like that, just just be there for them, so yeah. Thank you for that. And then I just wanted to add something really quickly. I actually went to Youth Day on Thursday up in Anaheim and they had a speaker who actually has PTSD. She got it um, not from the military but from an abusive relationship she had as a child. But um, she said, so another thing you could consider um, advocating or promoting awareness for, she actually had like a service dog that was trained to recognize when her PTSD was kicking in and then it would literally come and curl up in her lap and calm her down. So it, like if you advocated for um, like just raising awareness of the people that suffer from it, but also how they can treat it or how you can help other people who are suffering from it treat their disorder as well. Matt? Um, so I started my own club, but it seems you all know how to run things, and I'm struggling with that a little bit. So what, what advice would you give me on running things? Um, to start off with, communication, I would say, is number one. You always need to make sure you're staying, like, I, well, and organization, but make sure with your communication, you always let people know what you're doing, what you're planning on doing. And then that goes in hand with staying organized and making sure like you know what time you're doing something and like have like a schedule outlined for what you want to do both like short term and long term like make sure like for short term like oh we know like this is what we're going to do this friday or this day we, this is how we want to do it and then for long term like we want to try to do this like let's say twice a month or something like that and you know kind of keep it consistent and that way you like can keep it so that people know what's going on and then like it doesn't like change all the time that's really helpful because then people know when it's happening and know like, oh, today's, you know, like today's the day that our club meets. That's like really important. I know at our school, every time, like at the beginning of the year when you sign up with your club constitution, you have like a specific day that you choose to run your club. And then that way, like both that helps like the ASG class, like make sure that we have um, enough clubs on each day and that like not one day just has too many clubs and then also keeps it consistent for the, like the student body. I don't know where you're running your club, but I, is it at school? Um. Yeah, it's at school. I got the day, I got the meeting times organized. It's just within the club, it's a little bit difficult to keep everyone on task or like seems a little like they're not interested that as much. And then, so what I would say to go with that then, like you have it organized um, the time, so that's good. Um, what I would say would be to um, just try to have little goals for each meeting. Just um, have like, okay, today um, our big goal like for this whole club is to do this, but today this is what we want to work on. And then once that's done, then we can like talk and hang out and like do whatever like you want to do in the rest of the time in the club. But just like set yourself little goals for the club members, I guess. So that way they're not like overwhelmed. Like, oh, we have all this to do, and then they don't want to like start something because there's just so much work for them. Yeah. So um, one thing you can do, which I've learned through my youth and government program, 
I'm the chaplain of our delegation, which means I have to run all the icebreakers and stuff. So in the middle of the meeting or before we start a meeting, we'll have an icebreaker or we'll discuss our week or something like that just to make people aware that the other people in the club actually care about you and you're not just there with no friends. And then you have a little fun, so you know it's not all business. You can have some fun, too. So either taking that break in the middle to say, how is your week going? What are you looking forward to? What are your goals for this year, this month, this week? And that definitely helps. Right. Thank you. Yeah, something real quick. Um, what it sounds like to me is that you're kind of trying to run this thing by yourself, right? You have this group that's like there, you know, because I don't know, maybe they want to put it on their college app, like I was in a club, cool. Um, give them some responsibility um, and hold them accountable. Hold each other accountable, you know? Make yourself vulnerable to that same kind of accountability as well. I've found that I'm, I'm kind of like a take charge person um, and I like to take it all on. But when I do that, it's definitely maybe one of the least effective ways in a club to run anything. Um, because people like to know that they're important and that they have something to do, that they have a purpose. So give them that purpose, set goals, and then hold each other accountable. You know, It shouldn't just be you, why didn't you do this? It should be them saying, why didn't you do this? And then everyone else going like, hey, yeah, you need to follow up on that, or great job for doing that. So. Yeah, like I recently got elected like club pre president, so I know like the struggle is the same thing, but maybe holding socials, um, doing work all the time, like won't get people to be interested in your club, but having like going bowling, um, getting a group of kids together, going to see the movies, like you don't even have to do all the funding for it. People will pay for themselves, but just <coughs> getting, having some fun things to do as well will get people more interested. And also, Nick, I don't know if you've tried this before, but maybe like approaching um, clubs around your school, they already have like youth who are interested in helping their community, so I'm sure that you can find some support there. All right, thank you. Great advice, you guys. That, that was awesome. And it's, it sounds almost like they were even describing a team uh, discovery center, all the educators back here. When you talk about delegation, there are, there, there are educators that are team optimism, and that is their job. They are creating optimism, taking that strand through the summer, and even in the lessons we're going to do right after lunch here. Team communication, team informed decision making. Everybody has an equal role. Um, even this panel is led by you guys, not necessarily by the person in charge. So um, don't be afraid to, to give other people responsibilities and, and let them go forth. Um, but it is time to eat lunch. I know you guys are probably hungry. Please thank our panel one last time for being brave enough to get up here.